Let's turn our Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 51. <clears throat> As we continue on, a couple more weeks and we will be done. The judgment against Babylon. Tonight's theme is uh, the wicked and the wicked will be judged. And of course, that's referring to Babylon. But one day, all the wicked will be judged. Now, whether it is a religious system, whether it is the world, uh, whether it is a non-believer, uh, they will be judged before God. They will stand before him and he will sentence them one way or another. Chapter 51 focuses on Babylon's ultimate destruction because of what Babylon has done to God's chosen people. They have uh, taken them, slaughtered many of them, men, women, and children, but also then took them as slaves into their own society and tried to, um, in a sense, assimilate them to the Babylonian culture, removing them from uh, the presence of God and the land of God into a system that literally destroys God completely. And that's what I want to just share with you real quick before we get into this, because um, there are a lot of scripture verses here, and it, it's quite a bit, and we're going to do a little bit, a lot more reading than anything else. But I just want to share with you, uh, what is a believer? And if you get uh, a chance here, turn your Bible to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, because it's very clear here. We know that a believer needs to be born again. Uh, John chapter 3 is very clear, the words of Jesus Christ, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now the question mark is, what does it mean to be born again? So then he tells us that you need to, you, that all men are born of water, but then they need to be born of the spirit. So to be born again, you must be born of the spirit. Now, water depends on whose view you, you believe. Some say that it's uh, the water of the word of God that comes and washes you. Some say that it's the physical birth, that you are born through the placenta, which is water. You come into this world through water. I kind of lean towards that more than anything else because there's a, a, a fleshly birth and then there's a spiritual birth. And so I think that it's a fleshly birth. You have to all be born <laughs> into this world. Then there's a spiritual birth. And the spiritual birth is that new creation that God creates in your life. When you acknowledge that Jesus came, died for your sins, he paid for your debt, and you are asking him to forgive you, and you are trusting in his work, when you understand that completely, then he instills in you the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit comes inside of you. Now it is your responsibility to seek God. This is your free will. You choose to seek after him now. You want to know him. You want to understand him. You want to love him. You want to know everything about him because now it becomes a personal relationship with him. And so you're going to read your word. You're going to pray. You're going to go to church. You're going to take every opportunity to grow in your faith in Jesus Christ. Now, during that growing period, and that lasts until we go to heaven, that's what we call, there's a theological word for that, and it's sanctification. It's when God separates us from the world. Now we go to chapter 6 and he gives us a little bit of an idea there in verse 14. He says, do not be, and that's a command, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Pretty clear statement. You have unbelievers and now you are a believer. Don't be yoked together. You know what a yoke is, right? Uh, you yoke two animals together and they are to plow the field. Uh, you don't work together with uh, the unbeliever when it comes to certain things. Um, for what fellowship, again, here's a koinonia, the intimacy that we have. And, and the only way I can, say, I, I can share with you what that intimacy is, and it's probably one of the most profound ways of sharing, is the intimacy that I have with my wife is different than what I have with you. Your acquaintances, your brothers and sisters in Christ, I've gotten to know you, and we're growing as the years go by together, but you're nowhere near uh, the relationship that I have with my wife. It's very intimate. And so is our relationship with God. It's very intimate. And each one is, is different to a certain degree, but it's the same at the, at, at the same time. So we have this fellowship. For what fellowship, what intimacy has righteousness? Now, righteousness is our acts and the deeds that we do with lawlessness. Uh, what does righteousness, doing good, have to do with evil and wickedness? Nothing. 
That's, that's a, a rhetorical question. No, the answer is nothing. That's the answer that Paul is asked, looking for. And what communion has light with darkness? You ever notice that light and dark don't dwell together? Light's actually separated right now. This light has pushed darkness outside. We can see the darkness outside, but there's light inside because it can't dwell together. It can't mix it together. And so, again, they nothing. But what accord has Christ with Baal? Baal was an idol. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Nothing. This is the word of God. And Paul is saying that we have nothing to do with the unbeliever, with idols, uh, with lawlessness. Uh, something has changed in our lives. Something drastically, something radical. That it has converted us over to something that is so foreign to us. But it's worth it because we know that we have eternal life. It says, what, verse 16, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And that's where Babylon was at and, and with Israel. Israel had allowed idols to enter into the temple of God itself. And now you, you heard that video. What if I were to say, I'm Christian, but we let hard, uh, Harry Krishnans come in here and worship. I'm Christian, but Buddhists are more than welcome to sit here and worship with us. I'm Christian, but um, you know Mormons are, are welcome too. I'm Christian, but Jehovah Witnesses can come in here and we can all worship together. I'm Christian, and atheists are more than welcome to worship with us too. I'm Christian, and you know same-sex uh, homosexuals are more than welcome. Really? That's what Israel was doing. We, we're Jews, but we like the Canaanite gods, and, and we like the Molech, and we like these guys, and they're more than welcome to come into the temple, and they set up little altars for them too. What do idols have to do with God? Nothing, nothing at all. So then he goes on <clears throat> and says, I will dwell in them. So who's he dwelling in? That born-again believer. He dwells within us. That's amazing. That is amazing that God comes and resides in us, in our heart. He is a part of us. And that's why it's so important that we continue to be holy. We separate ourselves from the world because God is in us. He says he walks among us, among us. I will be their God and they shall be my people. That talks about relationship, koinonia, closeness. Then he says, therefore, now knowing all this, therefore, look at verse 17, come out from among them. Be separate, saith the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now, what are things that, that don't mix together? Can you get water and oil to mix together? No, you can't get water and oil to mix together. Well, fire and water. Can you mix fire and water together? No, you can't mix fire and water. There are chemical reactions that take place all the time. God is saying, hey, uh, there has to be a reaction in your life from the world. You need to come out of the world. You can't continue to live in the world. You can't continue to watch what you're watching. You can't continue to live the way you're living. You, you've got to change somewhere. That's radical living. That's a Christian, a true Christian that stands up there. I am Christian and I disagree with same-sex marriage because the Bible says that it is sin. I'm Christian and I believe that drinking wine may stumble my brother and I don't want to stumble my brother because I value who they are and I don't want to be at fault in causing them to sin against God. I'm Christian and I separated myself from this world. You know, I, I believe in monogamy. I believe that I have to wait and not like she says, but if you ask me for sex, I'll give it to you. You know, no, I don't. If you ask me for it, you're out of my life because that's not what you should be asking for. Just leave town now. <laughs> I don't want to even see you and so forth. So there has to be a changed life. Israel was changed. They were changed. They were God's chosen people. God had dwelt in them through the Holy Spirit and he was not going to let them go. Even though they were in bondage to Babylon, even though they had them captive, God wasn't going to let them go. And now he's judging Babylon and bringing back his people to the temple to rebuild it. And that's what God does for, for us. Now, yes, time to time, we get involved with the world. We mess up. We fall back. We get drunk. Maybe once in a while, I don't. <laughs> but you may. But repent. Turn back to the Lord. And seek him god's turning israel back to him and now they are responsible to serve him and focus on him completely 
other destruction is coming on Babylon. So let's go ahead and look at this, what the Lord promised, and we all know it. We've been listening to it for the past four or five weeks uh, of utter destruction on, on Babylon. So verse one, thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up against ba- or rise up against Babylon, against those who dwell in leb Kamir, a destroying wind, and I will send uh, winnowers to Babylon who shall winnow her and empty her land for in the day of doom they shall be against her all around against her let the archers bend his bow and lift himself up against her in his armor do not separate her young men utterly destroy all her army thus the slain shall fall in the land of the Chaldeans or Babylon and those thrust through in her streets for Israel is not forsaken nor Judah by his God the Lord of hosts though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel so again that relationship they are my people they have not been forsaken and I am now going to judge Babylon and I'm not going to allow any of them to live they will be utterly destroyed because I am what? The Holy One of Israel. And that's a name that Isaiah uses quite often. God is a holy God. See, that's what's, that, that is what's wrong with the church today. We don't realize that God is a holy God. We think God is our pal. He wants to make us happy. He, he wants us to feel good about ourselves. He, he wants us to give us what we want and that life is about enjoying the things of this world and that's not what life is about. God is a holy God and these things will destroy you. I was talking to a brother today and um, he said he's been dealing with this one guy and this one guy, this one guy said uh, uh, to him, hey, I want to get a prostitute for you. The guy's like, What? <laughs> And, I'm, and I looked at him and I'm like, yeah, you don't want to get a prostitute for me. You want to get STD for me. You want me to get AIDS. You want me to, to get a disease. You want me to, you want to kill me. That's what you're saying. That's what you're saying. God is a holy God and he keeps things from us because they will destroy us. They will kill us. Continue to drink. Alcohol will destroy your liver. You get cirrhosis and then you die at a young age because you continue to drink. But I'm having fun doing it, but you're going to die. And you haven't been any useful to the kingdom of God, but you sure have been enjoying yourself in this world. But you're going to die. It all destroys and kills you. Drugs, there's a cute little, uh, not a cute, but a little video on meth and how it destroys you. And it's a bunch of little kids uh, uh, talking about trying it for the first time. And it kind of flashes before their eyes uh, what they are now. And then just try it the first time, try it the first time. And then they try it. And then all of a sudden their eyes are open and all these people come out that are meth addicts. Yeah, we're your friends now. Hey, come over here. You're like us. You lost your family. You have no friends. You got to steal like us. Take, you know, and it's just so real and down to earth. It is amazing how the enemy is and how he draws us in. You know, the latest uh, fad right now is this uh, electronic smoking. You know that electronic smoking? And, and this is what's interesting is I'm seeing a lot of Christians now. Wait, look at this electronic smoking. And it's so cool, you know, and they're so cool and they're smoking this stuff. No, there's no laws. So even the kids can do it. They can actually smoke those electronic things. There's no laws on it. And the tobacco company knows this. And so they created this. Like, I'm sure they probably had it for a while and just keeping it until, you know, the, the, the you know, closing down of the cigarettes thing because they know that cigarettes kill you. And so the world even knows that. And so they put a stop to that. Pretty much uh, you can't smoke anywhere anymore, at least in California. But here's these electronic cigarettes. And, and they, they advertised it exactly the same way that they advertised cigarettes when they first came out. When you've seen doctors and, you know, everyone smoking those. Remember that in the 60s and 70s and you watch television that doctors are smoking while they're operating on patients, you know, because it's so cool and it was fine and nothing's wrong with it. They're, they're doing the same thing and people buy into that. What a lie. That, was, that smoke is going into your lungs just like a cigarette smoke is going into your lungs. Are you not smart enough to see that? You know, it's like, really? Come on. You think nothing's going to happen? Try, try standing in a fire pit and just breathe in the smoke long enough. You think that's not going to hurt you? Eventually it will kill you. All that, all that uh, you know, arsenic and, and fumes and, and charcoal and chemicals are going right into your life. It kills you. And the enemy wants to deceive you. 
with sin. And that's why we have to realize that God is a holy God. He's a holy God, and he requires us to be separate from the world. Flee from the midst of Babylon. God, that's what we need. Flee from Babylon, from the world system. And everyone save his life. Do not be cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her. Flee from Babylon. Flee from the world. Don't be caught up in the world because you know what? You'll be judged with it. And you will be judged. These people will be judged. Well, I'm, home, I'm a Christian and I believe that uh, I'm supposed to wait and have sex. But if you ask me hard enough, I'll have sex with you. you know, you're deceived because the Bible says not to, <laughs> period, until you're married. That's God's perfect plan for your life. The enemy's plan is for you to go out and die in seeking love. Babylon was a, a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drink. The nations drink her wine, therefore the nations are deranged. So God used them as a tool. Yes, he used them as a tool to chastise his, his children. And, and God will use the world to chastise you too, by the way. He will. Uh, you think it's fun and, and you'll get involved, but it will eventually kill you. It will eventually hurt you. And, and you'll be crippled for the rest of your life here on this earth or spiritually useless. Babylon has suddenly fallen and been destroyed. Wail for her. Take mom for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed, but probably not. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let us go everyone to his own country, for her judgment reaches to heaven and is lifted up to the skies. The Lord has revealed our righteousness. Come and let us declare in Zion, which is Jerusalem, the work of the Lord of our God. Make the arrows bright. Gather the shields. The Lord has raised up the spirit of the kings of the Medes, for his plan is against Babylon to destroy it, because it is the vengeance of the Lord. Then vengeance for his temple. Now, here's the Medes. These are the Medes. These are the ones that God will raise up to uh, uh, kill the Babylons. The Medes, you remember, and I spoke about last time, the Persians also, they're going to get some of the Persians to also help them to destroy um, Babylon. Set up a standard on the walls of Babylon. Make, make the guard strong. Set up the watchmen. Prepare the ambushes, for the Lord has both dis devised and done what he spoke against the inhabitants of Babylon. O you who dwell by many waters, abundant in treasures, your end has come, the measure of your covetousness. The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself. There's no one else to swear by, right? You're God. Who do you swear by? <laughs> no one else. There's no one higher than me, so I swear by myself. Uh, he promised, and when, his, when, when he swears that, that he's going to do something, he will do it. He will do it. And by the way, I'm not uncompassionate about your family <clears throat> and the people you know around you that need Jesus. And I'm not uncompassionate about how long maybe it's taken some of us to come to the Lord. God is a gracious God. And if we come now, he will begin to do wonderful things in your life. He really will. He'll restore things. You might have family that have been destroyed because of our own living. We may have pushed them away from God. Uh, we may have been great bad examples. But that's okay. I mean, it's not okay to do that, but it's okay. God will redeem that if you start now to seek Him and live that holy life. I've seen people um, turn back to the Lord because of that. Because God gets a hold of a soul. And the soul is active in the kingdom of God and excited. And people just get on fire when you're on fire. And so it's not too late. Don't give up. Don't listen to the enemy. Well, I really messed up. Yeah, you may have messed up, but there's still hope in Jesus. He's greater than even our sins are. For where sin is, grace even much more abounds. Stop sinning, but let the grace abound even more in your life. The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself. Surely I will fill you with men as with locusts, and they shall lift up the, a, a shout against you. Now we come to 15 through, through 19, and I love this section personally because I love to talk about our creator, God, and how he created. He, you know, our God has power. We have not even tapped into the power of God. You have not tapped into the power that's available to you. You know, when that guy said, hey, 
I'm coming out, and I'm like, 104, dude? I mean, really? Come on. I'm like, I feel bad for you coming out, but okay if you want to. But he says, oh, no, God will cover me. God's going to shit. I'm like, I'm thinking, okay, I know he can, but is he going to? Does he always know? But in this case, he did. And I tell you, that's answered prayer to me. Oh, no, you know what the odds are. We had thunderclouds over here. You know, you can give me all that. No, it came at the exact time that he was here and then left when he, you know, exactly. God's power and strength. He answers prayer. I was sharing with him. I said, um, you know, so, uh, I was talking with a pastor and, of another church, and it was a big church. And, and he was telling me that, um, you know, we had our sunrise service, and it was wonderful, you know, and so forth. And he asked me, how was your sunrise service? Oh, it was good. It was really good. Well, how many people do you have going there? I go, oh, about 50 to 60. It was one of our first ones. He goes, oh, that, that's nice. He goes, we had so many people, the freeways were packed. And I'm like, oh, wow. And I'm thinking, well, I really feel bad. And so then uh, I said, well, um, did you get rain on? Because it was overcast and it was raining. He goes, yeah, everyone got soaked. And that's funny because we had 50 people and, and we asked God not to rain on us and it didn't rain. Not only did it rain, but he opened up the clouds and it shined right on us as though he was there present. And he says, oh. So I'd rather have 50 with God's presence than, than thousands without God's presence. Amen. You know, that's what I'm talking about. The power of God when, when he's active in your life, he shows himself in your life. But you have to seek him. You have to seek him. You can't wait around for him. Okay, Lord, do something. No, seek him in prayer. Ask him. You have not because you ask not. And then even when you ask, you ask a miss to spend on you. Ask for something that's going to glorify him, not glorify you. Not for your own selfish reasons. Ask him, ask him for something that you can do for his glory. This is all for his glory. I'm only here because I've asked him, Lord, use, use this donkey. I don't know how. I don't know, you know, how you're going to use me, but use me. And this is all because of him, not because of me. It's interesting. We had a meeting yesterday, um, and we were talking about the movie The Neighborhood. How many saw the movie Neighborhood yet? There's a few at the concert or at the Summerfest saw it, but I'm thinking of showing it here. But it was talking about four Hispanic men whose lives were changed by the power of God. Guys that were murderers and gang members and God took a hold of their lives. And that's what I was focused on, the power of God. And one guy was um, sharing with us yesterday. He happened to be at this meeting. <coughs> and he was sharing about how he couldn't speak very well, a Hispanic uh, young man. And, and he was challenged by uh, Costa Mesa when he had this heart and desire to, uh, to serve the Lord. Uh, the instructor said, you need to learn to speak English. And he just, he said, I took that like really personal like how can you tell me i need to, what do you who are you tell me i need to learn to speak english you know but the spirit began to minister to him and he realized yeah i need to speak english you know what he did he went and hired a tutor so he could learn to speak english properly that's the desire that god gives you to serve him not for himself so that he could serve the lord doing something he's a pastor in santa Ana now serving god see there's power that we haven't even tapped into yet, that you haven't tapped into. Uh, power for you to live the life for God. Power for you to, to go beyond what people are, are, are doing around you. Power to, to be financially set even. Uh, and I'm talking about all strands of life. There's power there as long as it's used for the glory of God. Do your works before men so they glorify your Father in heaven. That's the challenge. Do it so they glorify your Father in heaven. And so he starts off, he says, he has made the earth by his power. He has established the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. Wow, God created the heavens and earth, not evolution, not some, you know, glob in the water that all of a sudden something spit it out into the ground and it started to crawl and, you know, become a polywog and so forth. No, God stretched it all out. He spoke it into existence. When he uttered his voice, there is a multitude of water in the heavens. He causes the vapor to ascend from the ends of the earth. He makes lightning for the rain. He brings wind out of his treasuries. Everyone is dull-hearted without knowledge. Every metalsmith is put to shame by the carved images for his mold image is falsehood and there is no breath in them. They are futile, a work of error in the time of their punishment. They shall perish. How can you compare idols to the God who created the heavens and the earth? You just can't. 
You just can't. You can talk till you're blue in the face to some idol that's sitting on an altar with a bunch of red little uh, uh, glass containers with, with wicks lit up and you put some money in a little box and you pray to this little guy there asking for something and nothing's going to happen because it's just an idol. But you can go straight to Jesus himself and he will hear your prayer and he will answer your prayer because it's a prayer that wants to serve him. And so everyone is dull hearted. Um, They don't get it. The portion of Jacob, verse 19, is not like them for he is the maker of all things. Israel is the tribe of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. That's the name that every knee will bow and every voice will confess that Jesus is Lord. He's the Lord of hosts. He is our God. He is my God. He is your God, and he wants to be personal and active in your life. You are my battle axe and weapon of war for with you I will break the nations in pieces with you I will destroy kingdoms with you I will break in pieces the horse and its rider with you I will break in pieces the chariots and its rider with you also I will break in pieces man and woman with you I will break in pieces old and young with you I will break in pieces the young man and the maiden with you also I will break in pieces the shepherd and his flock with you I will break in pieces the farmer and his yoke of oxen And with you, I will break in pieces governors and rulers. I will repay Babylon and all the inheritance of the Chaldeans for all the evil they have done in Zion in your sight, saith the Lord. God wants to use us. He wants to use us for his glory. What he can do in you, what he can do in you. Now, I'm blown away by the summer fest. I really am. I'm just, I don't know what we're going to do next year. I don't know what God's going to do. But, but for us to, we fed a total of 2,100 people, about 350 to 400 a night on a budget of $200 every Friday. That's what our budget was. And it was like God said, here's the basket. By faith, you're going to put your 200 and you just keep reaching in and it just keeps coming out. And we kept feeding and feeding and feeding. In fact, we always had leftover food, didn't we? Just like the, <laughs> the basket scene, just like the basket. Someone contacts somebody at the, at the uh, truck stop, the chaplain. Hey, I got all this food. You guys want it? Yeah, we'll take it. It's just a basket. And had leftover for people, the disciples that were cooking and stuff over there. They were able to take it home and still eat. I mean, that's power. That's God moving actively in the lives of his people. To see us like little ants coming in here, all organized, running over there, setting everything up, Tearing down, and everybody home by 10 o'clock, 11. It's like, that's amazing. That's God. That's God working in our lives. God's power is there, and he's using us, and he wants to continue to use us. But he wants to use all of us. It's not just for a, a certain group. It's not just a certain people, but it's for anyone that wants to separate themselves from this world and say, Lord, here I am. Could you use me? I don't know how, but use me. Somehow, wherever you want to go, Be prepared to go be prepared to do when you say that though and when he gives it to you don't stop don't hesitate don't think about it twice because the enemy will come in to stop you from doing that oh he doesn't like it and he will do whatever it takes to stop you from serving him because you just saw what God wants to do with you I will I will I will I will through you through you through you and my power (laughs) <laughs> and I will repay Babylon, he said. <coughs> Verse 25. Behold, I am against you, O destroying mountain, who destroy all the earth, says the Lord. And I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you down from the rocks, and make you a burnt, a burnt mountain. They shall not take from you a stone for a corner, nor a stone for a fountain, but you shall be desolate forever, saith the Lord. Set up a banner in the land, uh, blow the trumpet among the nations, prepare the nations against her, call the kingdom together against her. Erat, uh, meaning, and Ashkin, appoint a general against her, cause the horses uh, to come up like the uh, bristling locusts. Now these were all um, the leaders and, and rulers of the Medes there who were coming up against him. Prepare against her the nations with the kings of the Medes, its governors and all the rulers and all the land of dominion. And the land will tremble and sorrow for every 
purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon to make the land of Babylon a desolation without inhabitants. The mighty men of Babylon will cease fighting. They have remained in their strongholds. Their might has failed. They become like women. He uses that quite often, Jeremiah, uh, concerning the mighty men. They'll be like little sissy girls. You know, they'll be like little women. You know, and these are mighty men. These are warriors. And yet compared to God, they're little sissies. You, know, you, can't, you can't even compare yourself to the Lord. And you think about the power of God in, in, in battle array. When you, you see David and his mighty men, his warriors, you know, and one man would slay a thousand men. Now, how does a man do that? How does a man do that? You only see that on TV, in Matrix, right? When a guy stands in the middle and everyone's being slain. Well, we know that's TV. But imagine a thousand men on top of you and you're killing every single one of them. How does that happen? Only through God. Now, you might say, well, that's impossible, and that probably didn't happen. No. God can empower you with these muscles and strength and that all of a sudden you become Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, and you're a puny little guy, and now you're like, come on, you're with the sword, and, you're, and the Bible says that their, their, their hand was so gripped to the sword, they couldn't even let it go. They had to pry it open uh, afterwards because they killed so many men, and the force that was there as they were killing, and I mean, a thousand men and more than that. That's the power of God. We have yet to see what God would do. <clears throat> they trembled. The mighty men of Babylon have ceased fighting. Uh, they're like women. Uh, they have burned her dwelling places, places. The bars of her gates are broken. One runner will run to meet another and one messenger to meet another and to show the king of Babylon that his city is taken on all sides. The so, you know, they're messengers, right? And they're saying, hey, this is happening over here, running over there, running over there. They're saying, hey, we're getting destroyed. They're beating us up. The, the passages are blocked. The reeds they have burnt with fire. The men of war are terrified. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. When it is time to thresh her, uh, yet a little while, and the time of her harvest will come. The threshing floor was, was literally where you would uh, just crush the wheat uh, that you had collected from your harvest and so forth. And so basically they're being crushed and threshed. Verse 34, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, has devoured me. He has crushed me. He has made me an empty vessel. He has swallowed me up like a monster. <clears throat> he has filled his stomach with my delicacies. He has spit me out. Let the violence done to me and my flesh be upon Babylon. The inhabitants of Zion will say, and my blood be upon the inhabitants of the Chaldeans. Again, Babylon, Jerusalem will say. Notice how God takes this personal, because this is what's happening to his people. But he's saying, this is what Nebuchadnezzar has done to me. He takes it very personal. And that should warn us too about how we treat one another. Um, <clears throat> but be careful, because when we hurt others, it hurts God. And we sin against God. As David said, we sin against God, and only God do we sin against, uh, though we hurt one another's. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, verse 36, I will plea your case and take vengeance for you. I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. Babylon shall become a heap, <clears throat> a dwelling place for jackals, an astonishment and a hissing without an inhabitants. They shall roar together like lions and shall growl, growl like lion whelps. In their excitement, I will prepare their feast. I will make them drunk and they will rejoice and sleep a perpetual sleep and not awake, saith the Lord. Uh, they'll be all excited. They'll think they're winning, but God will just put them to sleep <laughs> with his power and strength. And I will bring them down like lambs to the slaughter, like rams with male goats. Oh, how Shishak, <clears throat> which is another word for Babylon, is taken. Oh, how praise of the whole earth is seized. How Babylon has become desolate among the nations. They'll be shouting this. They'll be shouting this. It, it would be like all of a sudden the United States being destroyed. And everyone's going, how could the United States be destroyed? How, how could this happen to the United States of America? Oh, my! America is destroyed. America is destroyed. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's hard for us to even fathom that America will be destroyed. And some think that uh, it won't be, that all this is just a part of a plan of those that are wealthy in America, what's going on today, and even to the point where the debt is really nothing. We just print up the money and pay the debt off. And that's what they're thinking. Um, just interesting how it all works. Who knows? Um, what do I know? 
The sea has come up over Babylon. She is covered with the multitude of its waves. Our cities are desolate, a dry land and a wilderness, a land where no one dwells, uh, through which no sun or man passes. I will punish Baal in Babylon, and I will bring out of his mouth what he has swallowed, and the nations shall not stream to him anymore. Yes, the wall of Babylon shall fall. My people will go out of the midst of her. Here we go, calling them out from the midst of the world. Let everyone deliver himself from the fierce anger of the Lord. Judgments is coming on this world. It really is, and maybe sooner than what we think. I hope so. But we need to get out of the world. Otherwise, uh, the fierce anger of God will be upon us. When the rapture happens, the church will be caught up in the air to Jesus. <clears throat> Our bodies will be transformed and we will be caught up, raptured up to the Lord. The dead in Christ first, those believers who had died, their souls and spirits are in heaven right now, but their bodies are here on the earth, right? So they're without bodies right now. That's, that's the truth. And so when, when the rapture happens, the bodies will rise from the ground wherever they're at through generations and generations. God will somehow be able to find them all over the world and, and match them right up to the souls and boom, they have their bodies. We're resurrected. And, and then the rest of the world has to go through what we call the tribulation, seven years, three and a half years of prosperity, of peace, the Antichrist will rise up, and then three and a half years of God's vengeance coming upon the world. Now there's a possibility in Matthew chapter 24, 25, 26, around there when it talks about two being in the field, one is left and one is caught. Both Jews, both doing the same thing, uh, could be speaking of the rapture. Some have suggested that person left could be one that is a believer, but because they have not separated themselves from the world, they're left behind. And they have to now live through all of that. And they're going to have to prove that they're a believer now. So if they were like, we showed the video, you know, I like a little wine. Well, let's see how you like a little wine during the tribulation period. And see how much you really will stand up for the Lord. Because as they were saying, we're not like some of those hypocrite Christians that are really extreme up there, you know, that are fanatics, you know. Well, it's the fanatics that will be gone because they're living by the word of God. And, they, and by the way, we're not fanatics. You tell me that being fanatic and loving people in Glen Avon is fanatic. So you won't get that report. Uh, I tried to put it in the uh, Riverside Recorder. They don't want to hear that stuff. They don't want to hear that stuff. They, they'll put everything else in it, but not Christians loving people and giving out food for free and events for free and bikes for free and all that stuff. Why didn't they write that? Isn't that news? Isn't that awesome? That's a good thing. They won't write that stuff. Why? Because it's tied to Christianity. And, and they want us to be looked at as mean, ugly people that hate everybody. And we don't. If we hated everybody, we wouldn't be doing things like that. This world's going to be judged. Therefore, behold, verse 47, the days are coming that I will bring judgment on the carved images of Babylon. Her whole land shall be ashamed and all her slain shall fall in her midst. Then the heavens and the earth and all that is in them shall sing joyously over Babylon for the plunders shall come to her from north, from the north, saith the Lord. As Babylon has caused the slain of Israel to fall, so at Babylon the slain of all the earth shall fall. You who have escaped the sword, get away. Do not stand still. Remember the Lord afar off and let Jerusalem come to your mind. We are ashamed because we have heard reproach. Shame has covered our faces for strangers have come into the sanctuaries of the Lord's house. Uh, so bringing about shame, uh, you can possibly see that here God is now chastising Babylon and the Jews are going wow God said he would do this after 70 years and now it's happening and then them walking to Jerusalem in shame what we have allowed to come into Jerusalem into the temple itself and they're just shamed knowing that God is the God of Israel and he still loves them I mean, that would be a place where, where, where God would want us to walk in humility at all times why would he choose me why would he choose you? Am I something special? Who am I? I still ask that question. Who am I? I mean, why would you uh, take a person like me and, and, and 
have me stand up here sharing your precious word. I don't get that completely because I know me. And I know that's only God's grace and it has nothing to do with me. Nothing at all. He has just chosen me, the foolish thing of this world, to confound the wise. He has chosen the abased thing like me so that people are like, wow, how does he do that? Because it's God in my life. Nothing else. I really related to that one pastor who was talking about uh, his language because I remember, and I shared this with you, share it again. I remember when I first hired on to Edison, I was just a 21-year-old stupid kid you know, that, that God's grace was on, and he got me a great job. I don't know how. <laughs> it just seems to be the story of my life, God working in my life, because I never should have got that job. Just put me in the right places with Christians who loved me, cared about me, and helped me get in. Never, and I wasn't a Christian at the time. So there I was, you know, and, and meeting all these new people uh, from different nationalities because they're now all working for Southern California Edison, you know, and I'm talking with them, and I'm just a stupid little kid. Didn't know what I was doing. Didn't speak much because I know that when I spoke, it just didn't make sense sometimes. And about 15 years later, after becoming a Christian, reading through the Bible over and over and getting educated from the Bible, God giving me the education, God giving me the language, God giving me words to say. I'm at a meeting and I'm sharing and I'm speaking and I'm the only one doing that and they're all just kind of listening to me as me and management are going back and forth. And afterwards they all come to me, Reuben, what happened to you? <laughs> Where did you learn how to speak like that? That's not who we know because we all went our separate ways after three years when we first got hired on. We all went to different uh, parts of Southern California. Edison and I went to Palm Springs. These guys went to Montebello. They went to Northern California, to Bishop, all over. And all of a sudden, we happened to meet 15 years later again. They're going, wait a minute, you're not that stupid little kid that, uh, that hired on in the beginning. What happened to you? And I was blown away because I was, I was just standing there. I'm like, what are they talking about? And then I realized it was my language and the way that I could present myself to the company where I couldn't do that before and that was only through the power of God I will through you I will through you because you yield yourself to him and say Lord here I am a stupid little kid use me I don't know how but use me he says okay <laughs> I can do that and he spoke through the donkey to Balaam you know and saved Balaam's life God can do that so behold judgment is coming the, uh, verse 53, through Babylon were to mount up to heaven and throw, though, or though she were to fortify the heights of her strength, yet from me plunderers would come to her, saith the Lord. The sound of a cry comes from Babylon and great destruction from the land of the Chaldeans because the Lord has, is plundering Babylon and silence her loud voice through her waves roar like great waters and the noise of their voice is uttered because the plunderers come against her, against Babylon, and her mighty men are taken. Every one of their bows is broken for the Lord is the God of recompense or he's going to repay. He will surely repay and I will make drunk her princes and wise men, her governors, her deputies and her mighty men and they shall sleep a perpetual sleep and not awake says the king whose name is the lord of hosts thus says the lord of hosts the broad walls of babylon shall be utterly broken these walls were 80 feet high they were very well known they fortified all of babylon and god says they're nothing compared to me they will be utterly broken her high gates shall be burned with fire the people will labor in vain the nations uh, because of their fire and they shall be weary <clears throat> now jeremiah gives a command to uh, this individual here <clears throat> shirah the word which jeremiah the prophet com uh, commanded shirah the son of near the son of uh, meshiah when he went up with Zedekiah the king of Judah to Babylon in the fourth year of his reign. And Shira was the quartermaster. Uh, a quartermaster was someone who uh, distributed rations, supplies, and so forth. So he has a word uh, for this individual. He, this guy was related to, um, uh, you remember um, Jeremiah was leaving with uh, uh, Zedekiah and another young man that they were leaving to Egypt at that time. If you remember back when we were studying about that several chapters ago uh, this is probably a relative of his so jeremiah wrote in the book all the evil 
uh, that would come upon Babylon, all these words that were written against Babylon. And Jeremiah said to Shereth, when you arrive in Babylon and see it and read all these words, then you shall say, O Lord, you have spoken against this place to cut it off so that none shall remain in it, neither man nor beast, but it shall be desolate forever. Now it shall be when you have finished reading this book that you shall tie a stone to it and throw it out into the Euphrates, which is the Euphrates River. Then you shall say, thus Babylon shall sink and not rise from the catastrophe that I will bring upon her. And they shall be weary thus far are the words of Jeremiah. So he is commanded to take the writings of Jeremiah, who wrote before these things would happen. Uh, think about this. You're, you're talking about 70 years later. Jeremiah is prophesying because God is telling Jeremiah what's going to happen 70 years later. He writes it down, and all of a sudden it comes to pass. See, we have a sure word. We can believe this Bible, every single word, just on the evidence of prophecy prophecy come on how many people can prophesy that an event will happen 70 years from now that's a miracle and the bible is very clear if you're going to prophesy in the name of the lord it better come to pass in other words when god says it it will come to pass if it doesn't come to pass and you're wrong you're a false prophet you haven't prophesied with god because god is 100 percent accurate every time when 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 Jesus entered into Jerusalem on a donkey, that fulfilled prophecy that was spoken by God in the Old Testament. Zacharias 9.9 9 was very clear how Jesus would come into Jerusalem on a donkey with people throwing palm branches. The odds of that hundreds of years later, it's weird. Over 300 prophecies were fulfilled just in the birth of Christ coming to Jerusalem. 300, the odds of that happening, totally weird. I mean, it's almost impossible to happen. You would win the lottery before that, that, you know, before those things would happen. I mean, prophecy is evidence that God's word is real. It really is. And so when you prophesy thousands of years earlier that Israel will return to their land and become a nation and govern over themselves as a people, thousands of years, over 2,000 years, and all of a sudden here's Israel in their own land governing themselves as a nation. In 1948, that's amazing prophecy. And so you can't tell me that the Bible is not the word of God and we can't believe it. What I can tell you is, is that we need to believe it and we need to live it because this word will reveal to us the truth and it will either save us or it will be thrown in a river and sink us. But that's up to us on how we ought to live our lives. And it's every word that's in here is the word of God and it's every word that is applicable to our lives not just some of it we can't pick and choose that's not up to us to pick and choose God has written it and we need to live by it completely does that cost us something yes it does I was sharing with somebody uh, uh, just some of the choices and decisions I've made and it's cost me it's cost me relationships it's cost me um, a lot at times but you know what? I can say that I lived the word. I lived the word to the best that I thought I know how and applying it. And it's cost me, but that's okay. At least now I know what it costs. And I know that when you do live it, it will cost you. People will hate you and revile you and say all kinds of wicked things. It's part of the Beatitudes, Jesus said. But you're living for the Lord. And that's why they say those things. Even Christians, your own brothers will argue with you and fight with you. But we're to just love them and smile and say, God bless you. <laughs> you know, I understand where you're coming from, but I'm going to live for the Lord. I know it's difficult and it's hard. That's a choice that we make. <clears throat> and you know what? I respect you for that, that you live for the Lord. I respect a lot of people that I disagree with, that they at least stand on their principles and what they believe. I really do, because it takes a lot of strength to live like that uh, before others and just giving in. You know. But if it's the word, you don't have anything to fear because it's the word, and you can show it and say, this is what the word says. I'm supposed to come out from among this world. That's why I've separated myself from this world. I have nothing to do with this world anymore. Oh, yeah, I go to the beach. That's not what I'm talking about. I go to the mountains. I enjoy the things in life itself. But I'm talking about the evilness, the world system. You know. 
I don't put my hope in the lottery. <laughs> I put my hope in Jesus. He takes care of me. You know, not the lottery, not California. You know, I don't put my hope in the president and who's going to be the next president, whether it's Obama or whether it's, I do like Huckabee. Is it Huckabee? I do like him. The fact that he was willing to take uh, uh, Kim Davis's place says, I'll go to prison for her. I'm like, wow, that takes a lot of, a lot of guts to say. Maybe he knew something I didn't know that he wasn't going to go. She wasn't going to go back. I don't know. But, I mean, you know, that, that's a person that uh, knows the Lord. You know, he was a pastor of a church, too. And he really believes the, the word of God. Um, really insightful individual. I'm not, I'm not telling you both from or anything like that. I'm just saying, interesting, interesting. You know, I respect him. We need to live our life for the Lord. We need to live our If you call yourself a Christian... Live it for the Lord and live it 